Part two, chapter eight of Concerning the Spiritual in Art by Vasily Kandinsky, translated by Michael T. H. Sadler. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter eight, Art and Artists. The work of art is born of the artist in a mysterious and secret way. From him it gains life and being nor is its existence casual and inconsequent, but it has a definite and purposeful strength, alike in its material and spiritual life. It exists and has power to create spiritual atmosphere, and from this inner standpoint one judges whether it is a good work of art or a bad one. If its form is bad, it means that the form is too feeble in meaning to call forth corresponding vibrations of the soul. Therefore, a picture is not necessarily well painted if it possesses the values of which the French so constantly speak. It is only well painted if its spiritual value is complete and satisfying. Good drawing is drawing that cannot be altered without destruction of this inner value, quite irrespective of its correctness as anatomy, botany, or any other science. There is no question of a violation of natural form but only of the need of the artist for such form. Similarly, colors are used not because they are true to nature, but because they are necessary to the particular picture. In fact, the artist is not only justified in using, but it is his duty to use only those forms which fulfill his own need. Absolute freedom, whether from anatomy or anything of the kind, must be given the artist in his choice of material. Such spiritual freedom is as necessary in art as it is in life. Note, however, that blind following of scientific precept is less blameworthy than its blind and purposeless rejection. The former produces at least an imitation of material objects, which may be of some use. The latter is an artistic betrayal and brings confusion in its train. The former leaves the spiritual atmosphere empty. The latter poisons it. Painting is an art. An art is not vague production, transitory and isolated, but a power which must be directed to the improvement and refinement of the human soul, to, in fact, the raising of the spiritual triangle. If art refrains from doing this work, a chasm remains unbridged, for no other power can take the place of art in this activity. And at times, when the human soul is gaining greater strength, art will also grow in power, for the two are inextricably connected and complementary one to the other. Conversely, at those times when the soul tends to be choked by material disbelief, art becomes purposeless and talk is heard that art exists for art's sake alone. Then is the bond between art and the soul, as it were, drugged into unconsciousness. The artist and the spectator drift apart, till finally the latter turns his back on the former, or regards him as a juggler whose skill and dexterity are worthy of applause. It is very important for the artist to gauge his position aright, to realize that he has a duty to his art and to himself, that he is not king of the castle, but rather a servant of a nobler purpose. He must search deeply into his own soul, develop and tend it, so that his art has something to clothe and does not remain a glove without a hand. The artist must have something to say, for mastery over form is not his goal, but rather the adapting of form to its inner meaning. The artist is not born to a life of pleasure. He must not live idle. He has a hard work to perform, and one which often proves a cross to be born. He must realize that his every deed, feeling, and thought are raw, but sure material from which his work is to arise, that he is free in art, but not in life. The artist has a triple responsibility to the non-artist. One, he must repay the talent which he has. Two, his deeds, feelings, and thoughts, as those of every man, create a spiritual atmosphere which is either pure or poisonous. Three, these deeds and thoughts are materials for his creations, which themselves exercise influence on the spiritual atmosphere. The artist is not only a king, as Paladin says, because he has great power, but also because he has great duties. If the artist be priest of beauty, nevertheless this beauty is to be sought only according to the principle of the inner need, and can be measured only according to the size and intensity of that need. 
That is beautiful which is produced by the inner need which springs from the soul. Maeterlinck, one of the first warriors, one of the first modern artists of the soul, says, There is nothing on earth so curious for beauty or so absorbent of it as a soul. For that reason few mortal souls withstand the leadership of a soul which gives to them beauty. And this property of the soul is the oil, which facilitates the slow, scarcely visible, but irresistible movements of the triangle, onwards and upwards. End of chapter 8. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine.